remote. This is the first of a series of trainings. Uh, we call it a full guide for commercial applications. Module 1 includes a remote introduction and the initial setup. What is remote? Let's start by defining uh, the platform. Remote is the Raypack IoT solution, an online management platform for Raypack products and clients. Allows you to remotely monitor and control units assigned to your network. Also helps to generate historical data and receive notifications when your attention is needed. Generate performance reports that allows you to make the right decisions and provide better service when required. Keep in mind that Remote is a live platform and is constantly being improved and renovated. Remote is a tailored solution for our Raypack service team. They can provide remote service and have better understanding of problems in the field. And on the same token, the Raypack sales force uh, is provided with uh, the ability to monitor and create a structure of their networks and regions. The Raypack channel partners are also benefit by this tool who could offer monitoring services and ensure uptime 24-7 to, to their customers. Finally, the Raypack clients, they are benefited by the peace of mind of controlling and monitoring our products in the field. The remote framework includes uh, two main tools, the uh, mobile app and the web dashboard. Among these tools, you can find 140 monitoring and control data points. Also, the uh, web dashboards could be customized based on the feedback of our customers, so we can tailor the, uh, the best ex user experience. Also, uh, the, uh, the platform includes multiple user roles and permissions. This can be defined per organization and per administrator. For example, if a specific organization requires the, the users not to be able to delete the devices or allow the staff members only to be able to monitor own devices, it can be set up in that way. Also, there is an analytics section that provides you with reports that provide you a, a, a feedback of the total uptime and downtime of the devices number of errors in one side, total of configurations between Modbus, EMS, indirect, target, or even classify the uh, incidence of a specific in, uh, event or error. Timeline events, organization structures. It's important to mention that key values are refreshed within two seconds of resolution. Last, last but not least, the historical data analysis that allows you to keep track of specific variables uh, and provide a you know troubleshooting analysis. Um, but uh, let's let's move on and take a look to a couple of videos. The first video is going to be about the uh, mobile app recognition. Uh, remember, the right at the app, you can monitor and control variables. Uh, we have uh, historical data analysis, diagnostic tools, custom notifications, color-coded events, and navigate through your organizations. Constant role and improvements are happening, so uh, you will uh, notice on, on the app few screens that are constantly evolving to uh, have a better user experience. But let's go and take a look to the app really quick. The first screen, obviously, the welcome screen. Provide your login credentials. And the first screen is the uh, uh, all the list of all the devices that are, are under your supervision. By clicking one of those uh, buttons, you can access the data of that specific device. The view screen includes system data. Be aware that all those great items are a indicating that the system is not configured to provide that information. For example, EMS items couldn't have a target uh, and so on, right? So the adjustment page will allow you to control some items as well, and as a few of them are grayed out. But the boiler data only shows a specific information about the local unit. You can scroll back and forth on the timeline of specific variables. 
like lower speed, flame current, inlet temperature, outlet temperature. And right there, you can go back to uh, up to, to three months of, uh, of historical data to analyze specific events. Each device includes some specific metadata that describes the unit. You can find information like, for example, device owner, uh, the job site, uh, model, serial number. It is very important to uh, request our users to uh, provide the device owner data and the job site. That helps, for, uh, that helps them to have a better administration of the unit. Let's go through the process of adding a, a job site. So by clicking job site and create job site, you can provide a name of the site and provide an address that will help to provide to locate the unit in a geolocation map for future reference and service. Heating season, um, it, it gives the opportunity for users to select a date just as a reminder. Um, when the, this, the, the heating season is, is, is coming, it, uh, the unit will recommend a maintenance or remind for maintenance. Uh, also, if something goes wrong, you can reconfigure or even delete the device right at the phone. By clicking the burger menu button on the right corner, you can add new devices. Or clicking the profile icon on the left corner, you can navigate through specific items of the user. Settings of the mobile app. This is a shortcut for the Raypack web uh, portal for help. The about button will give you uh, an idea of the uh, mobile app um, version. And the most important item is the uh, organization uh, icon, which is the little building icon. It, it allows you to navigate through your uh, the user's network. The uh, alerts button is a summarized version of the time events, but it includes for all the units that belong to your organization. And uh, this is a new feature, the uh, automation. By, uh, in the automation section, you can select the specific units and variables that you want to monitor. Provide a condition, custom a condition of when you want to be notified or alerted. In this case, the example is asking for flame current to be monitored, not to be less than 2.3 uh, micrograms. So if the, if the, the current drops below the TAR threshold, is going to provide a uh, notification and you can even no customize the text for that notification. These notifications can be turned on and off uh, depending on the, on the needs of the, uh, uh, the user. Or even delete it if uh, is necessary. Now let's do a quick recognition of the web dashboard. Right after uh, users log in, they, the very first screen shows them a list of devices that are included within their organization or even sub-organizations that report to, through uh, that uh, main organization. By clicking one of those, we'll open a portal where you can monitor the performance of the unit in just one shot. Some of the, the historical data will give you a, a good idea of the uh, execution or performance or operation of the unit, like for example, if the unit short cycles or not. You can have an idea of the cycles, burner time, flow, delta T, flame current, and somehow be, be aware of uh, the operation. Timeline events will give you an idea of all the errors that have occurred within a specific time frame, and you can also put notes uh, next to those incidents 
for the next person in, uh, to review. The service tab allows you to pr provide an, an, uh, a deep analysis of the, uh, the operation uh, and troubleshoot it right on the spot. You can select multiple variables and, and zoom in on a specific uh, portions of the graph, expand for uh, you know screenshots maybe to to uh, for, to provide a report. Also, a scroll uh, by just hovering the mouse, you will have a specific values of data points. It is a very powerful tool that allows you to troubleshoot right on the, on the spot on the uh, web application. The analytics section will give you an idea of the uh, 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 performance as well of the units, right? But more as a, as a system, it will give you an idea of uh, uptime, downtime, and specific errors. It is critical to understand how remote manage multiple sales and channel partners accounts. This slide specifically intends to depict how remote network tree works. Remote was created to support different tiers of access and management, and this allows customers to manage one or multiple devices. All this starts with the customer sites. Multiple customers from same reps or different reps, same regions and or multiple regions. Reps or contractors manage multiple sites, but they also could manage multiple contractors that oversee multiple sites, so there could be more sub-branches in between reps and customers. The rep sales managers manage multiple regions and reps, but the philosophy is exactly the same. Finally, the uh, RAPEC service team could access everything when a customer calls, only if they, they only need to provide a specific serial number of a unit and uh, or even name or email of the device owner and service team will be able to track down all those uh, uh, units and be able to access the data remotely. Sign up process. While there are some shortcuts on how to get users connected, the ideal and most recommended method is an invitation-based. This avoids what I call the uh, individuals and floating users. With an invitation, users are automatically assigned to a specific network into a specific organization or sub-organization. So the best approach to uh, sign up or provide credentials to our users is by invitation. When a user goes and signs up by themselves without an invitation, these users end up in an individual account with no device sharing or belonging. They are just floating. So uh, this is something that we get to see quite often, right? The users go, get the credentials, potentially they sign up a unit, but then the rep call us and ask, hey, I can't see my customer. Uh, so we will need to find the customer and transfer that customer to, to, to the specific rep or sales manager. That will be explained in the module, in the next module of remote. But uh, for now, let's just keep in mind that I will, our best approach is to generate invitations. So unit, users that are uh, uh, signed up individually, they could register units and be uh, an active user. It's just that they are not going to belong to a specific network. So once more, strongly suggested to follow the invitation process. And this topic will be fully covered as part of this training material. So the uh, RAPAC sales manager uh, is invited or is already created by RAPAC. So these users are these user accounts are already existing. And the RAPAC sales manager should send an invitation to the reps. The reps might send invitations to their contractors or subcontractors or potentially directly to a customer. They will get the invitation and the next step is just to press the button, follow the link and provide credentials and that will be all. Let's review this uh, sign up process case study. This is a typical uh, situation where, uh, for example, we have Pete that just sold an expert slide to a school district. Uh, it uh, belongs to a specific group of uh, a corporation, in this case, Boiler Bros, and uh, he's a RAPAC rep associate. 
Uh, Jane, on the other hand, is a school district manager. Uh, she's in charge of the boiler room, basically, of that particular site. And Jane wants to monitor the boiler data with remote because, I mean, whatever. She saw the uh, the, uh, the the brochure and she knows that these units can be actually monitored. And that was mainly the reason why they selected Raypack, for example. So she wants to monitor and none of them have credentials. So the next step is for P to call the Raypack sales manager and explains that they are sold the unit and they need to be connected. So Pete will actually call uh, the Raypack sales manager and ask for credentials. Uh, in that instance, ideally, the, the sales manager will provide those credentials. And uh, once the credentials are assigned, the Pete ideally should be <clears throat> capable of, of creating the suborganization for Jane, which uh, along with that creation of that suborganization will come with an invite for Jane. Jane will get the credentials and everyone is going to be connected under the right uh, configuration. Keep in mind that all these uh, blue highlighted items uh, on this conversation that I am showing on this, in this case study are going to be covered as part of this material. So what just happened? Pete uh, requested both four credentials and Pete created his own first network. Now, just because of that execution, Ripax service team in any uh, 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 event will be able to connect to Jane's boilers and, and provide service. So Pete has successfully initiated his network, which will allow Bob and Ripax service team to see and assist when troubleshooting and maintenance recommendations in the future. Now he can add more sites to his network. So this is very important to not to, to understand when when we get a call from uh, uh, our Raypack uh, uh, customers or uh, rep, and they ask about the remote. We need to have uh, keep in mind these key key, key uh, items that identify remote as a uh, as a, an asset for their application. So uh, Pete has analytics to complement sales reports for their company. When arriving to a problematic site, he knows exactly what parts it needs to bring. He can keep track of recurring failures and parts and add notes for next visits. The response uh, to his customers are, is much more efficient and sharing reports with Raypack is easier. I even started uh, to anticipate failures uh, before they might occur. And there is this uh, spark idea of a uh, they could potentially have a business model where they proactively monitor the data from customers and offer an uptime guarantee service. On the other hand, from uh, the final customer, they can all, all, they can all obviously uh, uh, have a better visual of the performance of their units, so they can, uh, you know, uh, uh, show off the uh, of uptime of their units. Uh, if something is going on, uh, she gets a notification so that she can take actions. Uh, when they call the service provider or the contractor, the contractor already knows what happens, right? What, what is happening and, and also providing feedback to, uh, to, to Raypack customer service is easier. So that, those are the main key reasons of why remote. The material of this training includes how to invite users, how to create organizations and suborganizations, and how to uh, provision units. How to navigate through the portal. Remember that the magnifier is your new home page and is the one that will allow you to search and drill down, navigate through your network, access suborganizations, and access devices under your network or fleet. While you're standing at and a specific organization, you can always press the gear button, which will take you to the settings of that organization, and what you do will impact that specific organization. The magnifier is your new homepage, users. First of all, uh, let's take an example of uh, the same example that we described before, Pitts Network. Where do you want to invite users? At which organization level? 
you want to do it at the service team, which is a global uh, manage, uh, management uh, network from Raypack perspective. From the sales manager, Pete, which is an individual contractor or rep, region rep of sales, or even at the Jane's uh, uh, case, which in this case will be the uh, uh, final customer. Sales organization, the rep org, or even the rep sub organization, which in this case is a final customer. So how to invite users? Remember this example where Pete calls uh, the uh, Bob, the Raypack sales manager, to uh, give, uh, give him access with, uh, to remote. Uh, Bob grants the invitation. So uh, now Bob receives the invitation and he's saying, OK, I have access, but I don't know how to invite more people to my network. In this case, uh, when we mean uh, invite more people, I mean inviting people at Boiler Bros Corporation. So those are colleagues of the same uh, uh, company as Pete. So this is the organizations that we're going to be inviting. This is your main organization. You want to invite people at your main organization. So first of all, Pete gets into the site uh, by providing the credentials. Then he has to go straight to the uh, gear icon because he wants to change those uh, uh, the settings of that organization. By pressing the gear icon, you will get access to the organization settings. Right after, go to the users tab and then press the button invite. Be aware that the portal itself is constantly changing to uh, give a better user experience. So it might be that the, the uh, tab sorting of the tabs on the top might actually change, but you will have always to look for the users tab or button and then press the invite button. The screen that appears is a prompt up window where you can provide the name, email address, the role of the new user that you're inviting. If it is available, you can uh, uh, assign a site or a uh, location then press save. Let's go over this quick video that shows the process uh, live. So users sign up with their credentials. They have the list of, the, of units that belong to them. You have to go to the gear button. So you press the gear button, then go to the users button. And then just press invite. Pressing save will send automatically the invitation to the new user and they just have to follow the instructions from there. So now, same process, but now we're going to invite somebody at a sub-organization level. So let's retake the same example. Bob calls, uh, repeat calls Bob for access on remote. He provides the credentials. Now Pete invites other people at Boiler Corporation, but also he's creating the sub-organization for Jane. And Jane says, OK, I have access, but you know what? In the night, I have to have uh, Ruben, which is going to be uh, accessing the, uh, the, uh, the, the night shift. So she doesn't know how to invite Ruben. So now Pete has to assist Jane, or even Raypack service team will have to assist Jane to create that uh, invitation for Ruben. So they will have to drill down to the other sub-organization and then invite the new user. In this case, the new user is going to be assigned to the final customer. So Pete logs in. Then instead of going to the gear, he could actually go to uh, uh, Jane of Organization by two methods. But let's just cover one of them. The organizations that belong to the uh, Pete organization are going to be listed in the little building icon. If, she, if he presses the building icon, the very first thing he's going to see is a list of all the sub-organizations that belong to his network. He will have to look for Jane's sub-organization, click on it, and right there, he's going to have the user tab again, and he can provide a user name, an email address, and an invite. Remember, there are multiple ways of achieving the same process or inviting people, right? Um, in this material, we're just covering one, which might be the most use, uh, used and common. But uh, there might be, as you move on on the expertise of this tool, you will find other ways to invite people. But this will work for a sub-organization invite. 
Now, the credentials are going to be sent to the final user over email. They will open the email, and the very common thing that happens is when they press the, 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 the button, if they have Internet Explorer, that is not supported. They have to open that button by using other Explorer. As a matter of fact, Microsoft has stopped supporting Internet Explorer, and now they are moving to uh, Edge, which is the new browser. But the, uh, Safari, Mozilla, uh, Google Chrome, all of those will actually work. The steps are pretty simple. They just have to press the button. Uh, and then follow the, sorry, find the email, press the button, and then provide a credentials. Those, those credentials are going to be set for his user, and moving forward, that will be the access point for them. So let's take a quick video of how to create sub, uh, invite people to sub organizations. They log in, they go straight to organizations tab, select the organizations that they want to create a user or invite a new user. This is an example of a suborganization. They press users and then just fill the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the fields or the gaps. And then uh, select the role and invite. For this video, I'm, I'm actually showing you an inbox of how the invite will get to final user. So I'm logging out. Then go to the inbox of that new user. And the email is right there. When they press that button, this is how it looks like. They just create credentials. They are asked to uh, set a password. They create a password, and the user now is, is active. This new user only sees his organization. He doesn't see upwards. He only sees downwards. There you go. So that user is created for a suborganization. So we have covered completely how to invite users. So now let's go over uh, how to create organizations in the first place. You have to click uh, Login. Go straight to your little icon, uh, building icon on at your portal. Create new organizations, as simple as that. When you create the, the new organization, the, that organization, the organization is going to be assigned to your network. It asks for a name, a description. And also, there is this little uh, slider uh, on the bottom. Take as an example of a, a rep. A rep might actually have multiple contractors or, or final customers. So they should be creating branches underneath them. So make sure that you enable this button when you're creating a suborganization for a rep or a contractor, because they might have multiple sites beneath them. For a final customer, though, it is possible that they don't need this tab, this, uh, this enable uh, button be, be on, because they may only be one uh, uh, site, right? But it is also possible that they may need another uh, series of sites. So, I mean, uh, it doesn't hurt. You can enable or disable per, need, uh, uh, per the needs of your customers or your reps. So it can be done that way. Um, you, uh, to, to make a more friendlier uh, portal, you can also add a logo uh, of your of their customer or the suborganization. You can go to the Users tab, and then make sure that always, when you're creating an organization, you assign an administrator. There is always this rule. If you create an organization, you better have an administrator email so you can start your organization with, a, with the right way, which is by having at least one administrator. It will save, save some time and problems in the future. But it can be uh, also uh, created without, but that is not recommended. What is recommended is if you're creating an organization, you better have an email address of your administrator of that organization. Provide a name, an email, and then press create. This is very important. If you get out of this page without pressing the create button, you lose the information that you provided for that org, and you will have to start all over again. The new organization is ready. But let's take a, this, uh, let's take a look to this quick video that shows how to create organizations. So users log in. They uh, go straight to that little uh, icon button, which is the, the building button. They create organizations. 
provide a name, organization number one. They enable the sub-organization creation ability. They add an icon. Just for the demonstration purposes, I'll be showing you how to, how to add an icon. There is a specific uh, uh, requirements for the picture or the logo. So this is a little tip. You can open the, 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 the image at the, in Microsoft Paint and then go to the uh, properties as shown and then change to uh, the 500 limitation. It will, it will like, extend or shrink the image accordingly. And then you will be able to add it as part of the logo, as part of the organization settings. Users, remember, you have to have a first administrator at least. Provide a name, an email. And remember, it's not going to send the email until you press the Create button. So press the Create button. The organization is created, and the email arrives at the inbox of that new administrator user. Repeat the same step for multiple organizations under your network. So I'm pretty much doing exactly the same thing and showing that you can create multiple organizations beneath you. If you click the remote logo, you saw that it, it shows you all the organizations beneath your, your uh, network. So now how to create sub-organizations. It's the same exact concept. It's just that you have to access to one of those organizations of yours and then create a sub-organization beneath them. Press Login. You have to go to the top remote icon. Like I said in the previous slides, that button allows you to navigate through the network of uh, your organizations. So by pressing that button, you can navigate through your network and select the organizations where you want to create a sub-organization level. So I press it, select the organizations that needs a sub-organization. Right when you press that button, now you are standing at the, the, that, that organization itself. So the next step is to add settings, changing some, like whatever you change on that particular standpoint will affect that sub-organization, not your network, not your top level. It's going to affect the level that you selected. So at that point, then you go to the build an icon, create the organization, follow the exact same philosophy, provide a name, description, enable if it is needed, provide a logo, go to the users tab and provide an administrator uh, email address. Don't forget to press create. The new sub-organization is ready now. So let's take a quick video on how to create this sub-organizations level. So when you go to the little building, you will see your organizations, but you have to go to the top remote icon. Select the organizations where you want to change or add or sub-organizations. And at that point, you go to the create the, the little building icon. Provide a name, a description. And it's just uh, depicting uh, in the kind of a fast track how to show the sub-organizations. Now they are shown on the same level, but you have uh, now nested uh, organizations to one of your or sub-organizations. If you, you uh, have to change something, you can uh, go back to that organization, press edit, and change a setting. Like in this example, I'm changing the sub-organization ability to create other sub-nested organizations. So now I'm, I am standing on one of those sub-organizations, and I can even nest more sub-organizations be needed. So that's a sub-sub organization. The same philosophy, right? Remember, just for the sake of this example, I'm not adding administrator emails, but every single time that you create an org, you have to have an administrator name. So that covers the organizations and sub-organization creation. How, to, how units are provisioned? And this is a material that is fully covered in the manual, but just to uh, go, go over the high-level uh, process, the uh, uh, mobile apps, whether they are Android or iPhone, 
have at some point to connect to the unit. The unit acts as a hotspot. So you provide the Wi-Fi credentials to the unit via a direct connection. Once that direct connection is established and the phones handshake with the unit, the Wi-Fi credentials and other uh, 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 description data of the unit, then this, this, this connection point is broken and the units connect to the Wi-Fi uh, uh, through um, the, the Wi-Fi modem at the building, uh, the boiler room Wi-Fi signal, the same thing as the, the mobile data. So the, everything starts on the 7-inch screen or the 4.2-inch screen of our products. You have to go to menu, then press the Wi-Fi button. And if you don't see the initializing uh, screen, you have to press reset. That will create a soft reboot and a factory uh, a resetting of the, uh, of the Wi-Fi module so you can start the process again. In Android, the uh, user experience changes a little bit from iPhone. But when you're in Android, you press Add New Device, then uh, you allows the unit, the, the, the mobile phone, to get permission to access the Wi-Fi. You provide the Wi-Fi network SSID and the password, and press Continue. And then you uh, select the connection to the unit. In this case, Hydronic XYZ. Remember the, this slide I was showing you. The uh, hydronic uh, uh, the, on this screen it will show you the hotspot of the unit. In this case, hydronic XYZ. So you select uh, the hydronic XYZ that establishes a connection with the boiler. The data from the mobile phone and the boiler start tra being transferred, and then right after it is uh, it is completely connected. The, the 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 difference between iPhone and mobile phone you will see it right now. Sorry, uh, iPhone and, and, and Android. Um, on iPhone, you have to add a new device, grant permissions, go to settings. That's the part that changes because uh, you you can't select the Wi-Fi right at the phone uh, at the mobile app of remote. You when you press the button go to settings, it'll text you to it te takes you to the uh, uh, iPhone settings uh, page where you manually have to the Wi-Fi go to the Wi-Fi and select the hotspot of the unit. Once it is connected, it does exactly the same process. Now. At this point, moving forward, everything is the same, iPhone or Android. Hey, once you uh, are connected, um, it is asking for a profile. So it just goes one by one on those uh, mandatory fields, which is device name, mob, model number, serial number. And the rest of the items are strongly recommended to be filled, like a site contact, model, a service provider, job site. Um, but uh, are not mandatory in the first uh, in the first process. You can do this on the web portal as well. So uh, again, uh, it is strongly recommended to do the uh, uh, job site creation. So one of those profile data points will say job site. You press one of them, create a new job site, provide a, 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 a name or the description of the site. It will ask you for some uh, directions. You can even use your location if the phone is next to the unit, and it will give you an approximate uh, location of that. Again, this is for better administration of that device, and it will help to locate when troubleshooting from remote uh, service team perspective. So here is a little video of uh, how the units are, pro uh, are provisioned, and a little demo on how the data is refreshed on the app. So add new device, the credentials are right there, press connect, go to settings for iPhone, manually go to the unit Wi-Fi hotspot, so that will imply that you have to go to the Wi-Fi. Make sure that you find the hydronic, in this case 44E04, select it, it connects with the, with the unit. This is the process where it's handshaking the Wi-Fi credentials. Once it is done, it is connected. Now, this unit had an alarm when we were doing this. So right when the unit is connected to the cloud, it broadcasts that alarm right away to the phone as a notification uh, balloon, or also um, will even, even send an email as well, little, little after, little after. Provide a name, then a, it asks for some of the mandatory fields, in this case here, a number, model, uh, device owner, hitting season, and this, there you go, this is the, uh, the app is now live. There are a lot of fields that we didn't uh, provide on this uh, on this uh, example uh, that describes the unit, like location and all that good stuff. But 
uh, for the sake of uh, the demonstration, it was enough. So now uh, we are showing you uh, the S6 is connected to a 10K sensor, and I'm warming up that sensor uh, with my hands. The temperature actually changes. <laughs> it, it gives the impression that it's changing faster on the app than on the screen. This is all happening at the same time, so it's pretty much real-time data. Okay, so for Wi-Fi troubleshooting, uh, you have uh, these screens where uh, if the Wi-Fi stays, the state says error, check the Wi-Fi signal name, SSID, and update if it, is, if it has changed. If the Wi-Fi password has changed, press reset button and just repeat the same process again. Uh, the uh, Wi-Fi, uh, uh, sometimes you might have a problem with the strength of the signal. So check the strength of the signal on the boiler Wi-Fi screen. If the Wi-Fi RSS ID value is not between minus 30 decibels and minus 80 decibels, consider using a Wi-Fi extender to boost the signal. Those are, are the most common and typical issues when connecting a unit. And that's all. So we have covered how to invite users, how to create organizations, sub-organizations, and how to units are provisioned. Thank you.